I'm Laura Malloy. I'm an opera singer and also a voice teacher and a writer and a producer. As you probably can tell from my accent, I'm not originally from England. I grew up in the United States. I didn't grow up in a particularly, well, I should say, I didn't grow up in a professional music family. So none of my uh, family were professional singers and it's just something I had to try. I had to find out if I could do it. But looking back and uh, with the perspective of time, I realized, yes, there was plenty of music in my family. Uh, my mother was a very good amateur singer. My father played the cello and the violin and a little bit of piano. My father's mother was a piano teacher at 17 when they're asking you, what are you going to do with the rest of your life and what are you going to study at university? I suddenly had an epiphany that if I don't try this, I'll never know. I'll never find out. So I'm just going to go for it and get the degree in music. And, and I just went from there. I inherited my voice from my mother, probably most obviously. And she was a very good amateur singer. She sang in the church choir. You could always hear her above all the rest of the soprano section in the church choir, which used to embarrass us as kids. Um, she just had a beautiful natural voice and she took some singing lessons and I took some singing lessons with her singing teacher and that was the teacher who said you know you need to take this seriously you need to study some more and with my mother's singing and joining the church choir as a kid it just seemed the natural thing but I was a very shy child it was very difficult for me to speak up in class I didn't like being you know picked on by the teacher I didn't like having to speak in front of anybody but singing was different I always felt I always believed that I could sing and it's hard to describe it without sounding arrogant but I just knew that the high notes were easy for me when we were singing in the choir the bits where a lot of people would start to drop out because it was getting towards the top of the staff and it was more difficult sort of F's and G's and getting up there it was easy for me to hit those notes I didn't have any problem with them and I knew sort of instinctively I was singing the right notes that were meant to be sung so I just I knew that there was a voice I knew I could sing high I knew I could sing accurately but I wasn't sure if it was just me thinking that or anybody else might <laughs> agree with me so it was a bit nerve-wracking to think of putting myself forward but I finally did in school for the school musical put myself forward and audition for a solo part and got one so it's that sort of terrifying precipice that we, I think every artist has, every person has of, I think I'm good at this, but what if I'm not? And the best advice anyone ever gave me, and this was somebody that I met at university, she said, if you're not feeling like you're making a fool of yourself, you're not doing enough. <laughs> Is always and I still to this day just feel astonished that I've done anything in this profession it's very difficult there's a lot of competition there's more than you would think because opera is not a hugely popular art form it's a very old art form it's survived all these years there's something about it that keeps people coming back and there's always a big a certain portion of people of the population that enjoys it learns to love it. I think you can learn to love it in later life. I think it's one of those things that takes some maturity, takes some time, takes some patience. I desperately wanted to sing musicals because that was what I listened to growing up. I mean, the, the soundtrack of my childhood is the old Mary Martin original Broadway cast Sound of Music. I would listen to that incessantly over. I memorized all the songs to that. I love the idea of singing a story, of getting through to someone with a song. It happens all the time in musicals. The, the, the female protagonist 
tells someone off through a song or really pins something down or you know expresses that she's in love with the male protagonist or whatever it happens in the plot it's a it's a song where suddenly she finds the truth in herself and she broadcasts it to the world and I just love that idea of you know get up and just sing it to them and they have to listen and then finally people understand you and I wanted to do that I wanted to or be in a rock band and audition for a rock band and they took one look at me and just went go away do not ruin your voice with us go and study you're going to be a proper singer you can't do this yourself um, any of the roles that that Julie Andrews would have sung those those kind of things they're high-ish but they're nothing like opera high <laughs> and my voice just kept going up and up and up so it wasn't just wasn't suited to anything else I got my undergraduate, a uh, Bachelor of Music, and then went on to get a Master of Music. And I was living in Minneapolis and singing in the chorus of the Minnesota Opera and being very frustrated, like a lot of my friends and colleagues, with uh, not being able to sort of get beyond that. I realized I needed to go to New York. It's kind of a pipeline. It's not an official one. It is, it's in the States where you... you get your graduate degree, you do the Young Artist or Apprenticeship programs, uh, there's lots of summer festivals that have Young Artist programs attached to them, and you do those for a while and you just kind of hope something catches fire and you just kind of keep going along. As long as you can stretch out the, the definition of young and <laughs> for opera singers it's up to, for women it's a little bit harsher than for men because of sexism and lots of things in history and the way opera works you know up till about 30 32 you're considered a very young opera singer because the operatic voice takes a long time to mature first jobs that actually paid enough that I didn't have to work another job was a tour in France uh, singing Cosi Fan Tutte uh, with a Bulgarian opera company and we, I studied French diligently before we went because I'm going to be touring in France for seven weeks. So I really ought to be able to speak French. And I went and took a Berlitz course and so brushed up on my high school French and turned up the first day of rehearsals. And our director was Italian. And she was livid that no one else spoke Italian. So that was uh, the big, the, my big international debut and uh, all the excitement that went with that. But I very quickly learned that all the things that we think are glamorous on the outside are really not that glamorous on the inside. And so rehearsing when you're jet lagged and doing three or four shows a week, being put up in cheap hotels, and uh, you're on the bus with the rest of the cast and the orchestra, it's really grueling, it's really tough. But it's what you have to do, it's what we all go through. Very, very few uh, singers sort of rise instantly to the top and don't have to go through this period of doing the school shows and the young artist things and working a temp job while you're paying the bills. Um, one of my favorite New Yorker cartoons is someone coming out to the front of the stage and saying, due to illness, tonight's Mimi will be sung by a temp. <laughs> because we were all, we were all working as temps, <laughs> office temps. Um, but it was a really fun time too. You know, we carried along and then I married an Englishman and moved over to the UK and just kept on plugging away and I got uh, my debut with Opera North as Queen of Night and Magic Flute and then it was English National Opera, etc. And I sang that role with English Touring Opera, with Pegasus Opera, with Welsh National Opera and with the Royal Opera House before it was all finished, before she left the building, because now I'm in my 50s and I don't sing that role anymore. So <laughs> if now I'm singing Wagner, now I'm singing heavier and lower roles. Most of the roles for women, especially for high sopranos, Queen of Night is an exception to that. Most of the roles, you're supposed to be a very young 
lady indeed, maybe 14 to 18, 19 years old, and very, very beautiful, and um, that's it. And we can sort of carry on suspending our disbelief while you're in your 30s and into your 40s, but uh, it, it gets more difficult after that. And we have sort of the physiological changes that come with aging for women and menopause and all that and the voice does change as we grow older and we you know you will lose some of the very very high notes I mean that I am an ex I was an extreme version of that because sopranos who sing queen of night and these very high roles it's a very small subset so we call it the, the dramatic coloratura uh, voice which has just the highest notes that anyone ever sings really so it it's not natural it's not normal it's not typical and it gave me um, my career turns out a lot of sopranos not so many mezzo sopranos or altos and there's not a lot of work for all the sopranos who are out there if you're a high-voiced woman yeah there's less opportunity for the older lady shall we say so we have to make our own and we we need more women composers we need more women running opera companies we need to, to change the the ethos of it, but it's to do with history, it's to do with the fact that all art is like this, the, f the movies are like this, television is like this, novels are like this, opera is based on very old novels and plays. Singing gives you a little bit of a, of a barrier, of a of sort of suit of armor, because it's not your words, it's not your notes, it's someone else has written this and it, it kind of gives you a little layer of protection. You've got a pianist playing or an orchestra and it's not just you alone, but you still get nervous. You still get nervous, but it's, you don't often get to enjoy sort of just the fact of being on stage. At the very end, you get applause, which is nice, but you're so, so focused on where am I supposed to move? What comes next? What's my next word? Is the conductor pointing at me? Is it my turn to sing? And getting all that right. And you've had weeks and weeks of rehearsal to prepare for that. So your mind is not on like, oh, look at me. This I'm on a stage and there's a spotlight on me and there's hundreds of people out there. It's You really can't think about all that because you would get distracted and not be able to do your job properly. But every once in a while, you, you try to remember that it is special. I had an audition at the Metropolitan Opera in New York and to Americans that's the ultimate thing. I think if you brought up in this country the ultimate thing would be to sing at Covent Garden. The Met is the biggest thing in America and I was able to get a stage audition there and I walked in and I was nervous and I was just like, I've got to sing this, I've got to hit all the notes right, I've got to do this, I've got to that, you know, and I, I got through my first piece and they asked for another piece and I got through that and then they asked for a third piece and, and I just thought, Laura, you're standing on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera, you might never ever get a chance to be here again, just kind of soak that in for just a second and I allowed myself just a moment to kind of go, and then right back to, yep, got to sing this. And uh, what's the next word? What's the next phrase? What am I trying to do here? What, what's my character thinking? All that sort of trying to got to do a, a good performance because an audition is a performance. Uh, but I did allow myself that little moment because I thought, yeah, this is kind of special. Um, and I got the job. So, hey. And It's a whole body exercise singing. You need good breath support. You, you need to worry about your posture. You need to think about lots of different things. And when you're really singing full out, when you're singing 
as loud as you can, your whole body vibrates with that. You feel it. And it takes you to a different place. I mean, it is, they've done studies and brain waves and, you know, they, you are going into a, a different state when you're performing and when you're doing music. Anybody singing, making music, you are accessing a different part of your brain and this whole artistic experience. But I just knew, like, this feels good. I want to do this. I want to always do this. Singing is healthy. Singing is necessary. Singing is good for your mental health. I always said, I don't need to get road rage because I can just go scream an aria. <laughs> I, I don't think I'd be heartbroken if I wasn't able to sing in front of an audience again. At some point that will happen. At some point I will make that decision. Probably, hopefully I make the decision, not someone else telling me. Uh, but yeah, you still need to to make the noise. It's good for you. I've always taught, even when I was still a student, I was teaching. It's something I've done, you know, alongside my singing career. I've never thought of it as something that you fall back on or that you do later. I like doing it. It's stimulating. It's interesting. It grounds you. It um, it makes me think of my own technique because if I'm teaching someone else technique and I have to think about how do I do that, I love that it's something that I can carry on with when I do make that decision to stop performing, um, that I can still carry on making music in some way. We're just lucky that we can do this with our bodies. We can make these incredible sounds that most human beings can't. It's an amazing thing to be able to do. And just to pass on a bit of that to other people is, is good. As a performing artist, you do get frustrated because you're always being told to, what to do by others. You've got a director, you've got a conductor, you've got a choreographer, you've got a designer, you've, you've got all these other people whose job it is to make the show fantastic. And opera is a huge undertaking. It takes a lot of people and you're just a cog in that machine even if you're singing the leading role. So you're part of something that's much bigger and you're not always very rarely called on to use your own creativity. You can choose to become a director then or you can create your own pieces of work and that's what I've done is mainly to do with art song and sort of recitals and quasi recitals and an expanded definition of what a recital is. I've also commissioned a composer to write some new pieces. I've uh, made a podcast and recorded those and, and wrote a story around them. Um, and the latest thing I'm doing is called Disturbing the Peace because I'm also a politically aware person. I um, won't bore you too much with it. I think you can guess where I stand on a lot of things. Um, but, you know, sort of taking my passion for issues like women's rights and my passion for creating something or taking old things and making new things out of them and putting that together and um, exploring what it is that makes art about disturbing the comfortable and comforting the disturbed. It, it just gives me an outlet for all my mad ideas. And that's why my company's called Femme Lunatique. <laughs> so it's just, you know, you've got to get them out there or they'll, they will make you mad. So you've got to express it instead. But that's, yeah, that's that. And the writing is just, I think of things, I've got to write it down or it'll go around in my head forever. So, yeah. <laughs>